All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. I uh, I hope that you're all doing okay today. I hope you're all doing okay. Welcome back to Comp thirty three fifty Software Engineering one. Uh, today, what I want us to do, what I want us to spend some time doing, is to uh, is to take a minute to reflect on the previous iteration. The, the goal that I have for us today, in terms of reflecting on the previous iteration, is to just give you an opportunity with your teams, of the teams that are here, of the people that are here, to be able to talk to each other and kind of just you know, take a breather, basically. Reflect on what happened in the last iteration now that it's been delivered and try and make some decisions about changes that you, at least, again, the people that are here, the changes that you would like to make to the way that you're going to keep working together going forward. Some of this might be reflecting on the decisions that you made uh, that I suggested that you make changes to. So like deciding how you're going to do assignment of tasks. So if you're going to do layer-based work or if you're going to do full stack type work. The other thing that I want us to do today is uh, spend some time taking a look at software design principles. So this was officially part of the reading from last week. And we're a little bit behind in terms of the topics and the readings, but that's okay. I'd like to get through this today, uh, mainly because I want to make sure that you're able to identify these different kinds of uh, design principles, and then I'd be able to identify violations of these principles. As you're going through and building code for iteration two, we're going to be taking a look at these in your code. I'm going to be looking for these in your code to see if I can find them. And your goal is to try and make sure that you're not violating these design principles with the code that you're writing. Before we get to any of that, I do want to uh, just make a couple of announcements and kind of overview of what's going on for iteration two, because that is started now. Uh, First and foremost, let's go back to uh, iteration one. Iteration one has a peer evaluation form that has been posted that is now available for you to fill in. This is an Excel spreadsheet. And the idea with this Excel spreadsheet is that you are providing assessments. You're, you're telling me, basically, you're telling me how much of a contribution your teammates have made to the project. The due date for you to submit this is next Tuesday, so you have some time to think about it. I'm not going to like make you all submit it immediately on the spot. But the basic idea is that you've got 100 credits to spread around to your teammates. You should try to assess your teammates in terms of the contribution that they believe you believe that they've made to your project. So consider things like the contributions that they made to planning, so the technical and non-technical planning artifacts that you were putting together, the communication that you've been able to have with your teammates, the availability that they've had throughout the term to be able to get together and work with you, participation in non-code writing tasks. So somebody adopting the role of code reviewer is a totally valid choice for you to make if that's what the way that you want to organize your team. They don't necessarily have to write a lot of code, but they could be producing a lot of input for your team to help make your code better. Uh, but also, also the quantity and quality of the code that they were writing um, for the project that you're putting together. One way to assess people on their contributions to projects is to go and look at the version control repository and see who's been making commits. I don't, I don't like to do that. I don't think that accurately reflects people's contributions to a project, especially when they're taking on roles that aren't necessarily a lot of code related responsibilities with their team, but they're still making a meaningful contribution to their team. When you submit this to the assignment folder, uh, this is confidential between you and me. I'm not sharing the feedback that you're giving me with your peers. I'm, I'm not doing that at all. This goes into my inbox and then it stays there basically. The way that I use this peer evaluation is uh, to, to scale the scores that your individual teams are getting for projects. So you know what your team's project gets as an assessment will be scaled using this strategy. I take an average of the scores that are given to me by the teams. 
Um, and I also try to look for things like, you know, there's one half of the team that says the other half is doing nothing, and then it's the opposite in the other case. In situations like that, I will start going and taking a look at the version control repository just to see, you know, what other evidence I can collect. But I try not to, uh, to use that as a primary source of information. You don't have to submit this. If you don't submit this, then what I'm assuming you mean is that you believe that everybody in your team contributed equally. You can submit this and just set, set that default distribution of points. That's kind of up to you, um, but it's not required for you to submit this. The folder on UMLearn is restricted to accept Excel spreadsheets, so please just submit this spreadsheet. Fill it in, save it, and submit it uh, as an Excel spreadsheet. Using an Excel spreadsheet helps me so that I can use automated tools to get all this stuff instead of trying to do it all by hand because that's error prone, me copying and pasting stuff from people's submissions. Are there any questions about the peer evaluation form? Good, okay, good, good, excellent. Let's move on. Let's talk about iteration two. So I've posted the description for iteration two, and I have also updated the sample project on uh, GitLab. So the GitLab sample project now reflects what you are expected to do for iteration two in terms of your own setup. In iteration two, you're going to keep working on your project. So obviously, you're going to keep building the same project that you started working on in iteration one. The main new addition is that you are going to be adding a SQL-based persistence layer. So a relational database persistence layer as opposed to just using the stub implementations that you had for iteration one. The work that you're going to be doing for this is that you're going to be trying to finish up the user stories that you had originally assigned to iteration one but didn't have time to complete in iteration one. You're going to have to start building user stories and developer tasks for new features. And you're going to have to start planning out those new features and user stories based on the same approach that you did for iteration one. So filling up as much time as you think is appropriate for, um, this, for this iteration. The implementation of the SQL database is it, it has to use this specific relational database software called HSQLDB. This is kind of an older approach to, to doing this. I know that Android has support for SQLite built into it. I know this, I know this, but I have to insist that you use this library for doing SQL because it will make integration testing easier later. If you use SQLite, yes, it's built into Android, but using it for integration testing later is going to be more painful. We really want you to be able to do integration testing without using the emulator. And the only way that we can do integration testing or the best way for us to do integration testing without the emula emulator later is to use HSQLDB. So to use a library that doesn't depend on Android's implementation. The stub databases that you've written already don't go away they instead move to a different part of your repository. So you're gonna build up relational database implementations of your persistence layer interfaces, and you're going to move the stub implementations into the test part. The test parts, the unit tests that you're writing, they can and should still use the stub implementations. The actual Android app that you're writing should now use the relational database implementation. The documentation for this iteration is, uh, is similar to iteration one. I want you to keep working on this architecture diagram. So show me the classes and the class names that are in each of these and the relationships that they have so that I can quickly see what, uh, which, which parts go where. The evaluation for this work is going to be graded out of a score of 25. And they're going to be allocating, we're going to be allocating points approximately equally across it, functionality implementation quality, and then the quality and thoroughness of your tests. Functionality here is the number of user stories that you have been able to complete and, and whether they work or not. The implementation quality, this is going to be part of what we're discussing today, software design principles. So making sure that you're not violating any software design principles. 
And then the quality and thoroughness of your unit tests is, is making sure that you have a good and reasonable test coverage and the tests that you're writing are evaluating appropriate behavior for the, for the user stories that you've implemented. Hand in is gonna be the same. So we want you to make a release on GitLab, make a tag, make a release, and then attach the APK that you built for iteration two. There's a rubric that sits alongside this document. I'm not gonna spend any time looking at that, but it's there. Please take the time to look at it on your own to get an idea of what the precise details of the expectations are for um, iteration two. Any questions? Yeah. Oh, right, thank you for reminding me. Um, if, if you want a tablet, uh, the way that I am going to ask you to get the tablet is to go and see Jeff Durston. Jeff lives on the fifth floor of this building. So I'm gonna give you directions right now. If you go out the doors at the back of the room here, I need to get those like seat belts and stuff like their flight attendants have got. Uh, you go out the back, you go out the back here, you go to the stairwell, you climb up to the fifth floor, and then you get off the stairs and you just go turn right immediately, turn left, turn right. Okay, I'm getting off the stairs, I'm turning right immediately, and then there's a doorway that's right beside the stairwell, and there's three offices there. That's our tech staff. Uh, there's Ryan, there's Jeff, and there's Gilbert. If you want to get an Android tablet, you should go talk to Ryan or Jeff, and they will help you sign out a tablet. And you can go at any time, just drop in basically. Uh, if you want to make an appointment with them, uh, I can post an email address that you can email, but they're often there and you'll just find one of them up there. I don't, uh, so I'm going to look it up. This isn't helpful at all. Uh, I don't know the room numbers. Sorry, I don't know what the room numbers are. But the two people that you're looking for are Jeff, Jeff here, and uh, and Ryan. Yeah, sorry, I don't know the room numbers. Any other questions? We're good. We're good. Okay. I uh, really, really quickly just want to show you um, I want to show you something about the sample project to give you a sense of where your uh, code is going to be and where your changes are going to be in this. So this is the sample project and as it's been updated for uh, iteration two. In the persistence layer, we now have a new package called HSQLDB. The persistence layer also has a set of interfaces. So we've got this course persistence interface. The stub that we'd implemented before implements this interface and the course persistence HSQLDB class implements the same interface. And the idea here, like we said before with the three tier or N tier architecture, is that we just want to replace implementations of these parts without having to make changes to other layers. This will give you an idea of the kind of changes that you should be making to your own or for the classes that you should be creating for your own relational database implementation. So the kinds of things that you're going to have to get set up. So like making a connection to the database um, and using uh, prepared statements and that sort of thing to insert and retrieve things from the database. The, uh, the application part here, uh, this services, this is a class that was used in this sample project for the first iteration. But what this is doing is providing uh, singletons. We'll talk about design patterns later in the course, but a singleton is a design pattern where you can create one instance of an object and then that's it. You're only allowed to create one instance of this object. And then that same instance is shared across a bunch of different uh, classes that are using it as a dependency. So this class is using this design pattern, uh, singleton design pattern, 
And now we're creating a single instance of this HSQLBEB implementation and all of the classes that use that um, in interface, the student persistence interface, are getting the same instance of the class. So we create just one. In the main class here, we have uh, this database name field. HSQLDB works by having a file that's available to it. And this DB name is used as part of the file name for what it should be loading up when it starts. And the unfortunate part of using HSQLDB as opposed to uh, something else is that we have to do some really awkward um, setup here. So in this home activity class, there's this new method called copy database to device. This is, a, this is a mixing of concerns. This is a violation of the three-tier architecture that we were talking about because our presentation layer knows about the persistence layer. This is the unaccept, this is, an, oh gosh, I'm trying to say this. It's okay for you to do this. It's not unacceptable. It's an acceptable thing to do. It's okay for you to do this in this specific case. You should just copy this method. Don't try to write this on your own. Just copy and paste this method into your own code. This is not going to be a, a misconduct situation. Just copy and paste this whole thing. You don't have to try and set it up yourself. This basically goes through the process of copying a database file, a pre-existing database file, into a cur the correct directory on the device itself so that when you start running, uh, making connections to this database, it's using that file name. Um, the other thing that I'm going to suggest that you take a look at and make comparisons to your own uh, stuff is in the Gradle setup. So I believe it's build.gradle. No. Here, yeah. So this build.gradle, uh, we've added a new dependency here on this HSQLDB library. So you'll have to add that to your Gradle so that it imports it into, uh, into your own project. I think that's everything I need to show you to get you started with building this implementation. Uh, I guess the other thing is to say that we just copied and pasted. We just moved that whole persistence from the main uh, Java folders into the test folders so that we can keep using them for the tests, the stub implementations. We'll keep using them for the tests. And that kind of means that as you build up the interface for your persistence layer, you'll have to start making changes in both the relational database implementation and the stub implementation to make sure that you can keep working with it. We're good. We okay? We're okay? Okay, good. Excellent. Great. So yeah, like I said, this is posted up on, uh, on GitLab, so you can find that there. And you can start making comparisons to your own project to get yourself set up with a relational database. OK, so let's, uh, let's take some time to look back. Let's take some time to look back. Agile software development, and I'm going to actually say uppercase A Agile. Uppercase A Agile, as is described in our Agile manifesto, one of the key things that we want to get out of this whole idea, this philosophy of how we're going about building software is that we want to be able to respond to change quickly. Responding to change quickly partly means taking a look back at what we've done before. From a client's perspective, uh, a, an iteration review is going to be the client reviewing with you, so you together with the client, reviewing the non-technical planning artifacts that you came up with. So taking a look at your vision, taking a look at the features, taking a look at the user stories, making sure that they are all still the same thing that you collectively want to build. So as an activity with your team, not today, we'll do other stuff, but an activity with your team might be look at your vision. Is this still achievable with what we've learned in the last iteration? As we started building this, does it still make sense for us to want to build this? Or is there something more appealing for us to build? Is it still technically possible? Did we figure out that we just can't actually do what we wanted to do? So do we have to change our vision? 
going through non-technical planning artifacts like the vision, the features and epics, and the corresponding user stories, and deciding whether or not they still make sense, just reminding yourselves of what they are, is an important first step to reviewing an iteration. And this is something that you should do on your own time. If you need to make changes to your vision, if you need to make changes to your features and epics, if you need to make changes to your user stories, that is OK, and you should make those changes. Document those changes, but make the changes if you need to make changes to it. From a development perspective, that's us now. From a development perspective, it's kind of less clear immediately what we should be doing. And this is what I want to focus on today. There's two places for us to look when we're thinking about reviewing the te technical components of our uh, process. The first one is uh, is what I've called bit space. Bit space, you know, the code basically. Thinking about code, thinking about uh, what we've written, and thinking about how we're going to write it going forward. And then the other part, the other place to look is in meat space. And and meat space to me is like us as humans working together, trying to build something. So the 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 kinds of things that we're doing together as people. Technical reviews from the perspective of looking at code. They're also looking at coding style. So you may or may not collectively as a team have decided to use the same formatting style or the same structure for how you're going to build different parts of this application. Taking a look at the architecture that you put together and used and chosen and selected for the project and deciding if that's still the appropriate architecture to use, trying to make sure that the code that is in the right place for what part of the architecture it's supposed to be in this is one piece that I, I, forbid you to, I forbid you to change architectures for this project. You must continue to use the interior architecture, but in a, in a more realistic situation, you might decide that a different kind of architecture is better for you. The kinds of questions that you as a team should, beginning, should be beginning to ask here are, what parts of this application were hard to build? So you're sitting at your computer at, I don't know, 3 p.m. on Sunday afternoon and just feverishly trying to get something done. What was hard? What was hard? You started thinking about this earlier. You, everybody started thinking about it earlier. Everybody started thinking about it earlier. You started thinking about it earlier. What was still hard to build? What was hard to build? More importantly, why was it hard to build? What made this part of my application difficult for us to build? What was the hardest part about doing this? Sometimes that might be, well, if we reflect on the interface that we were using or that we reflect on the structure that we were using, that's what made it hard to build. And so we should change the structure that we have there. Sometimes it might be, I just had no fucking idea what I was doing. And that's OK. Why was it hard to build? I just didn't have any experience. But now I have some experience. And so it should be a little bit easier going forward. The other path of this, and this is where you're starting to think about working together with other people. Some of you have done this before, and some of you haven't. But what parts were hard to use? Other people built parts of your application that weren't you. You're in a state right now where you don't know everything about your project, and that's OK. That's, that's life. That's the way that building large software projects works. When you were starting to use other people's code, what was hard to use? And why was that hard to use? This object in our data model that we have, it just seems to be doing way too many things, and I don't know which part goes where. Or we have a thousand data model objects, and I don't know which thing is responsible for what. What do you do to change that? Well, now maybe we should start bringing these together and making them smaller or splitting them apart and making them bigger. I'm going to ask you to do a technical review in class, and I'm going to ask you to do this in two parts. The first part that I want you to do together has to do with the uh, sticky notes that are on your table. I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to do this. And I want everyone who's here on your team to, uh, to independently answer this question. What was the hardest piece of code that you had to write? So you don't have to talk to each other for this. What I'm looking for you to write down is either the name of a class that you have in your code base or 
uh, some approximation of that or like some specific package that you're looking for? What was the hardest thing for you to write? I'm going to put two minutes on my timer. Write something down. Do it privately. You don't have to discuss. And then we're going to move on to the next part after that. OK, I'm going to move to the next part. If you haven't written something down, that's totally fine. Uh, you'll have some time to keep working on that part. But the next part of this technical review is I, I want you to start talking to your team about why that thing was hard to implement. I'm going to ask that you try to do it this way. You don't have to do it this way, but I'm going to ask that you try to do it this way. Pick somebody in your group that has a screen that is big enough. Al this could alternatively just be everybody opens the same thing at the same time. Just work together to get that thing um, up on a screen. I want you to give all of the sticky notes to one person, and then I want that one person to just pick one of them, and then start working through the person who wrote the sticky note, why was it hard to build that thing? What was hard to build about it? This exercise right now is an opportunity for you to get started having this discussion. You definitely need to continue having this discussion with your team after class. So if you don't quite get to doing everything, that's totally fine. But at least take the time to get started and get a sense of what it is that you find hard to work with and how you might go about changing it if possible. Okay. So I'm going to put a little less than 10 minutes on my timer, but uh, please go ahead and then we'll all get to get back together after that. All right, so like I said, you should keep having this conversation. Keep having this conversation uh, some, somewhere else, though. Somewhere else. Keep having this conversation. Some of the goals that we're trying to accomplish by doing this is just to give you an opportunity to discuss code in a situation where you are not feverishly trying to get something done, to have a relaxed conversation about the state of your code base, to be able to have commentary on the state of the code base where you're not yeah freaking out and panicking and trying to get everything done at the at the end of when your release is supposed to happen so when you get a chance please keep going with this conversation but for now we're going to move on in the class the other half of this is reviewing meat space so we've been thinking about code here. We're trying to look at the technical details of what it is that we've been doing. Now we want to switch to doing a, a little bit more of a non-technical review of technical people. The one half of review from our client's perspective is reviewing these non-technical planning artifacts. And this is something that you and your team should be doing. But there's also a lot of non-technical stuff that you as a dev team are doing with each other, like communicating, but it has nothing to do with your clients. It's about how you're approaching the way that you're doing things. So the kinds of things that you can be reviewing with your team about uh, non-technical parts of your project are things like communication, how satisfied your team is with the way things worked. This can be an awkward conversation to have. This can be a very awkward conversation to have. And I'm not going to make you have this conversation in class. But it is a reasonable thing for you to discuss with your team. You know, iteration one just sucked. It was terrible. It felt really bad to be on this team. Trying not to point fingers. So the goal of this part is not to say it really sucked because of you. That's not the goal here. That's not the goal here. Sorry for pointing at you. It's more about identifying the things that were causing this situation to feel terrible. Trying to identify the, the things that were happening there. And maybe it's things like, we just didn't set clear expectations for each other or for ourselves. Nobody really knew how or when things were supposed to be done. And so people got a little bit frustrated with the way that things were working. Here are some questions that you can use to guide these conversations with your team. 
as a team, just very broadly, what worked for us? So thinking about things like the communication tools that you were using, thinking about things like the branching strategies that you were using, thinking about things like the way you were distributing work to your team, thinking literally about the tools that you were using for communication. Say you picked Discord and you were primarily doing chat. Is it going to be something that, uh, is that working for you? Or is it something that you should be switching to like, we need to have verbal conversations or should we switch to using Zoom or should we sit in a classroom together and actually be face-to-face -face talking to each other about this thing? Identifying the things that did work is one thing, but then trying to think about why that specific thing worked, how it helped make things better for you and your team will help identify more things that you could be doing with your team. Like, can we do something similar in the next iteration? This really worked. I liked using Discord because it was somewhat asynchronous. I didn't have to be on it all the time to talk to, each, to everybody else. And I could see a record of our discussion. So let's keep using Discord in iteration two. This is the kind of conversation that I'm looking for here. What didn't work for us as a team? This can be, I didn't like that we did everything at the last minute. This can be that. I really don't like that we did everything at the last minute. Why didn't it work? Because it was super stressful to try and get everything done at the last minute. The reason that this didn't work for me is that it felt made me feel really, really stressed out. How can we change that in the next iteration? Let's just together as a team agree that we're going to pretend the due date is a week before it actually is. We're just going to like convince ourselves, we'll gaslight ourselves into thinking that the due date is earlier than it actually is. No, that's not the due date. It's always been one week before. It doesn't matter what the documents say. How can we make changes to that? How can we reduce this stress going forward? Let's pretend to do this. Let's get everything done by this date. Let's stay up late the night before this week before the due date to get everything done. And it won't feel quite as stressful, hopefully, but we'll make observations about that and do a similar reflection after the next iteration is due. I'm going to give you about five minutes to do this with your team. Just to try to identify the things that worked really well with your team. Try to identify what you're going to keep doing going forward. Try to identify what maybe didn't work quite as well. Try to identify how you're going to change that if you're going to make any changes to it. I'm going to put about five minutes on my timer, but again, this is just the start of this conversation. You should keep having this discussion with your team outside of class. Okay, please go ahead. All right, okay. So like I said, please, please keep having this conversation. Please keep having this conversation with your team. The goals of both of these exercises are really about opening communication with your team. Yes, there are side effects like, yeah, we can make changes to the way that we're doing things, but the primary goal, the primary benefit is that you are just talking to each other and making sure that it's easy to talk to each other when you need to talk to each other later in the future. Let's switch topics entirely. We, uh, we had previously talked about some software design principles and how they're related to these ideas of coupling and cohesion. Solid is a set of software design principles that are collected and curated by somebody named Robert Martin. Robert Martin is another one of those big names, just like uh, Martin Fowl. Robert Martin, Martin Fowler, and Kent Beck. So Kent Beck's the outstander here. Uh, Robert Martin and, and uh, Martin Fowler are big names in software engineering. These were not like conceived by Martin. He did not come up with these ideas. He just collected them and wrote about them. So other people came up with these ideas, but he put them into this neat fitting acronym and sold it to people. Adhering to these design principles is intended to help manage coupling and cohesion in objects in object-oriented programming uh, and object-oriented paradigms. The idea is that you're trying to reduce the coupling that you have between components and increase the co cohesion that you have within a single object. It promotes understandability if you're following these design principles, you're going to be able to understand code that other people has written that follows it, and other people will be able to read your code and understand it and use it. 
It promotes flexibility. Some of the uh, design principles that are here are directly related to making sure that you can replace implementations without having to make changes to the code base itself. And it increases, it, it increases maintainability. So making sure that you can make changes to your code going forward without having to do uh, much in terms of thought. Solid is five principles and here's what they are. Here's what they are. The S in solid stands for the single responsibility principle. Do one thing and do it well. An object, a single class should have one single responsibility and that's the only thing that it should do, nothing else. The open closed principle says that a class or an object should be open for extension. So li literally in terms of like inheritance and extension, but closed for modification. I should be able to extend this class to make changes to its behavior and then use that subclass. I shouldn't have to change the class itself. The L is Liskov's substitution principle. This is named after Barbara Liskov, who is a software, who is a software engineer, uh, an engineering researcher, software engineering researcher. And the idea here is that I should be able to take a class, a type, and I should be able to replace instances of that with its subtype, and there should be no changes. I should have a method on a shapes class that's called area, and I should be able to put a circle or a square or a triangle. And if I call area, I should still be able to use the class the way that I expect it to. So this is kind of related to polymorphism. The interface segregation principle says, if I have an interface that has many clients, then I should have many interfaces instead of just one interface. This is related to the single responsibility principle. Single responsibility says do one thing and do it well. Interface segregation says, you might have a single object that does several things, but have different interfaces for different clients. Only put in that interface as much as that specific client needs for this thing. So if it does several things, have multiple interfaces that different clients are using for that thing. The dependency inversion principle says, I should not be making instances of something that I depend on. Rather, somebody should be giving me an instance of the thing that I depend on. So this is typically looking like a constructor that takes as input an interface type. The specific place where this dependency inversion principle is used in the sample project is providing an instance of the persistence layer to the logic layer. You depend on an interface of that thing and we are injecting specific implementations of that to that class. Let's do a quiz. You can do this as a team. Good, good. I spoke clearly. I spoke clearly. Do one thing and do it well. The single responsibility principle says you've got a class, that one single class should do one thing and it should do it well. So null hit that the fastest. Good job, null. Good, good, excellent. Use inheritance liberally. Yes, I, I suppose these two are related to each other, but this is a lot more about extension should be used to add 
new behavior to a class hierarchy as opposed to making changes to the class that it, uh, itself. Okay, big changes here. That's Barbara Liskov, by the way. Okay, good. Subclasses can replace superclasses without changing other code. I should be able to provide a new instance of some subclass without having to change the rest of the code that's being used. Depending on an interface of an object and not its implementation, it's related to that. It's absolutely related to that, but it's a lot more about actually being able to make that physical change. Great job, Stack Overflow. Okay, good, good. Design interfaces for each client instead of universal ones. So you've got this object, you've got this thing that you're trying to use across several different clients, several different classes that are depending on that. Instead of having those classes depend on this entire object that does maybe many things, have them depend specifically on the things that they need to do. And that means having an interface for each of those clients. So exposing only the functionality that that client needs to do what it needs to do without having it to depend on the entire thing. Any implementation of an interface can be used by a client. So again, these are related. This is true based on that. We can conclude that from the first part, but it's not what the interface segregation principle is saying. And this one, unfortunately, is the opposite. So we don't want to really have a universal interface for the entire object, but rather we want to have specific interfaces for each client. OK, null is moving back up, but Stack Overflow has a stranglehold on the top spot here. Really proud of finding that picture, by the way. Okay, great, excellent. Classes should be provided with instances of their dependencies. So a class should have a dependency on an interface, and it should be provided with, as part of its constructor, an instance of that, a specific instance of that interface that it depends upon. OK, wow. OK, there's one last question here. Oh, no. Yeah. Well, apparently more people have seen it than not. I'm really impressed by that. OK. OK, do we have predictions here? Hooray! OK, great. Let's immediately move to the next activity. I put all these pieces of paper on your desk. This is a document that's also on the course webpage. So you don't all have to share this same single piece of paper. You can find this file on the course webpage so you can load it up on your screens. I just wanted to make sure that if you didn't have a screen, you had something to look at. 
I'd like to step through as many of these examples as we can before the end of today's class. So what I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to give you about three or four minutes to, to look at this code, to read it. I'm going to say three minutes. Look at this code and read it. We're going to be going example by example. We're going to start with number one. Decide which solid principle this violates, and then we'll talk about it together. So I am going to put this up on the screen so you have which solid principles there are. I'm going to give you three minutes to read example one, and then we're going to get back together and, uh, and take a look at it. So please go ahead. I, th <laughs> I thought briefly about having you try to like shape your finger. Uh, yeah, let's do that. Shape your finger into the thing that you think it is. Uh, so here's the first one, person. Here's our class. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to step through S-O-L-I-D, and what I want you to do is raise your hand if you think that it violates that principle. So S, does it violate S, single responsibility? Put your hand up if you think it does. Okay, O, one person, okay, L, nobody, one person, okay, I, one person, D, okay. This absolutely violates the single responsibility principle. Completely violates the single responsibility principle. This is a class that's called person. It is what I would call or what is generally called a plain old Java object. That's all it should be. It's just a bag of data. That's all this class should be is what represents a person. It should not have the responsibility of exporting itself. It shouldn't have anything to do with Excel. It shouldn't have anything to do with JSON. It should just be responsible for being a bag of data, and that's it, nothing else. This toString method, this is OK. This does not violate single responsibility to me. ToString is just part of Java's object model. If this were to print that, then I would say, yeah, this is beginning to violate single responsibility. If you were to take this two string and start printing it out, yes. One of the issues that I have with two string and single responsibility principle is when you start taking the code that you've written and you try to start translating it into other spoken and written languages. If you put all your two strings in English and then you use two string everywhere to present that information on your screen, it's going to be really hard to change it to use uh, like Mandarin and Cantonese and Tagalog and Spanish and Icelandic and all of those other kinds of languages. Using this internally for yourself for debugging messages, totally fine. Yes, absolutely. But when you're doing presentation, that's not the responsibility of this class. The main reason that this violates single responsibility is this export method. This method, this method right here also violates open closed. It violates open closed because if I want to have another format for export, I need to change this method. I need to add another case. I need to add another key. I need to add more code to this method to support having another uh, way to export this thing out into another format. This also violates Liskov. This also violates Liskov, technically. And the reason it violates Liskov is because of this line right here. It violates Liskov because when we're exporting to Excel, we're writing to a file, whereas when we're exporting to the other formats that are provided by this method, it's expecting a string back on the other side. If I return null in this case, it's unexpected behavior for that, uh, for that subtype. It doesn't violate interface segregation. There is not much of an interface here. Arguably, because it violates single responsibility, it does violate interface segregation too, but eh, not really. Dependency inversion, well, technically, it <laughs> violates that too because it's taking instances of Excel and stuff like that, but that's kind of getting too far into the weeds. The main violations here are single responsibility and, uh, and open closed. Let's move to example two, unless there are questions. Uh, stop for questions. Good, good, okay, let's move to example two. I'm gonna put three more minutes on my timer. Please go ahead. Okay, 
So just, uh, again, show of hands, S. Does this violate single responsibility? K, O, open closed. L, Liskov, I, interface aggregation. D, dependency inversion. K. My, my answer here is, this is, this is really shitty code, but uh, it doesn't violate any principles. This does not violate any principles. The, the one place where you could say arguably that this does violate a principle, and this is really, really arguable, and I fully disagree with you, is that a person's name is not part of an address. That's the only thing. But because this is called person address, that's it. This is a person's address. All of these properties here are things that are related to an address. This has a single responsibility. It is to have an address for a person. Open closed. The smell that you find, and this is the term I'm going to keep using to describe these things, the smell that you find in code that represents a violation of open closed is conditional statements testing instance of or switch uh, blocks. So testing to see some key and then changing behavior based upon that. This does not violate open closed because you can just make a subclass of this and add new behavior if you want to. This doesn't violate Liskov because, well, this, this doesn't do anything. It's just a bunch of accessors. This doesn't violate interface segregation because kind of, again, be related to a single responsibility. This is just doing one thing and not anything else. Dependency inversion, this has no dependencies. Strings, I guess, but it doesn't depend on like that it's an array of null terminated characters, for example. It's just the string type that's there. So yes, this is bad looking code. There are so many properties in this thing, but it doesn't really violate any of the principles that we've outlined here. This is the only trick one. This is the only trick one. The rest of them do violate something. I think we have time for one more if I give you one minute. I can, either, I, I can otherwise just uh, like briefly step through them. I think that's the best way to go forward so you can review this on your own time. I'm just going to briefly step through them. And then I hope that you all have a great break. So let me step through these. Uh, you're going to have to remind me which one is which. What is example three? What's the class name? Person exporter here. OK, so this now is, uh, I would say that this does not violate single responsibility anymore. Its only responsibility is to export a person object. Uh, it does still violate open closed because of that switch. We've, we've enumerated it now. We're not using strings anymore. So it's slightly better in terms of design, but it still violates open closed because it depends on a parameter that you're passing in to switch. And if you want to add more exporters, you have to change the switch block and you have to change that enumeration. It doesn't violate interface segregation. Oh, sorry, it, doesn't, it still violates Liskov because of this uh, return null. It doesn't violate interface segregation because this is an interface that has exactly one method on it and there's nothing else. So that's the only thing that it does. Dependency inversion, again, related to making instances of, the, of this Excel sheet, maybe, but that's really hard to convince me that that's uh, a, a, de a dependency inversion violation. Okay, what was the next one? What's example four? This one here, okay. So this is now uh, solving open closed. So the violation that we had in open closed with the last example, this solves it by just making all these different classes. This does not violate single responsibility anymore. Or it never, it doesn't violate single responsibility. These are, these are all in the same file, but they're all separate classes. So each one of these independent classes does the one thing that it does and it does it well. This doesn't violate open closed anymore because we don't have this conditional block that's testing for what it is that we're trying to export to, we can just add new classes to this. We can add new classes to this without having to change the existing code. This still does violate Liskov because of, again, this return null. That one subtype is not giving us the type that we were expecting back, so it still violates Liskov. It doesn't violate interface segregation because, again, it's just one single method. We're not having multiple clients depending on different behaviors here. And it doesn't violate dependency inversion um, because it doesn't really have dependencies. And then I think the last one here is, uh, is this data access and then access course. So please forgive me for not remembering what the numbers are, but uh, 
this violates the dependency inversion principle because we're creating an instance of the thing that we depend on. The solution to this is uh, to change this to be the interface type and then to change your uh, constructor to accept an instance of that. So that's the way that the sample project is designed. So if you want to see the solution to that, take a look there. And the data access one, this violates the uh, interface segregation principle. So you have this data access that does a bunch of different things. You might have a single class that's responsible for all data access. But because this is having an interface for each of the different kinds of clients that it has, which are the logic layer classes, um, separating these out into separate interfaces, which again is reflected in what the sample project looks like, is the way to, uh, to solve that problem. Wow, OK. Thank you for giving me a couple of minutes of your time. You should, at this point, be able to conduct a reflection with your team. You should be able to list and define software design principles and identify code that violates uh, these solid design principles. Thank you all for coming out, and I hope that you have an excellent reading week break. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>